Hi, everyone. My name is Natalie Sampson. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Environmental Justice Committee within the Environment section. I'm just going to say a few opening remarks before we hand it off to Amy to really facilitate the evening. So thank you for being here. Welcome to Perspectives from California and Flint, Michigan for creating the healthiest nation. We have a bit of a power panel here, so I think it's going to be a good evening. Um, hopefully, you're surrounded by people who have a shared vision for EJ. Um, based on who signed up to be here, we know we have some students who are figuring out how they can do this impactful work. We know we have some advocates on the ground that are really pushing our decision makers to think about EJ issues. Um, agency staff who are really struggling and trying to find their way through roadblocks to do this work. Um, and just a, a range of public health professionals. So I think this can be the start of a really productive conversation today. Um, and we, we can't go on without thanking a few people, so bear with me, but we have quite a few people who made tonight possible. Thanks first go to our lead planning team, Amy, of course, Daldi and Charles back here as our fearless leader. We've also had a bit of a sounding board. Uh, 50 or so people from California have weighed in on this event, offering some different perspectives on how to really have this conversation. It's not an easy conversation to have. Um, thanks to Laura August of Cal EPA and Yolanda, Yolanda Sanchez. Um, I hope that you check out the Cal EPA and EJ screen poster back there and ask them questions. Um, also, please tweet. We have some signs up around the room with the hashtag. Thanks to all the people working, our convention workers, our volunteers. We have some representatives from San Diego State University, um, or I'm sorry, School of Public Health specifically, our um, interpreters, videographers. Kate and Ayana, are you in the room? If you are, please um, shout out to Kate and Ayana, our staff from APHA, who dealt with so many details and made this all possible. So um, if you see them, please, please thank them. Um, and then, of course, our sponsors. So the Environmental Health Coalition, Comité Civico del Val, SDSU, School of Public Health, APHA, and the Kresge Foundation. Um, I know, I think that Chris Cabell and Jalan White Newsom from Kresge may or may not be in the room. If you're here, thank you so much for your support. Um, so with that, thank you for coming and being here. And if we have anyone on the live stream, um, we hope to engage with you through the event in the evening and beyond. So I'm going to hand it off to Amy. I love these guys because they made it, the thing work for us. You know, like I can see over this thing now because the excellent union or team here made that possible. So it's just kind of thrilling, you know, as a, as a beginning. You jump, oh, you yeah. know. So anyway, um, I've been working with this group as a facilitator in order to try to make, figure out how to best accomplish our goals. And I just want to say to all of you who are here that we know that everyone in this room has something to say and could be up here. And if we had time, you know, 15 minutes from everyone in here would inform us all. And I would actually like to see that, though we might need to have our PJs too. You know. um, but what we tried to do was to balance some different objectives and goals here in bringing information to you, giving the, the group in the room and uh, everyone a chance to speak amongst themselves and as a group uh, and, and to have time for the, a town hall discussion in the end. And if you add up all the little minutes here and there, the, the speakers and the, and the audience have about the same amount of time. And we, we did that on purpose. So I just want you to know we really tried hard to bring a good, interesting, forward-looking, current set of speakers for you and also give us all a chance to hash over what that means, how it informs us, where else we have to go, et cetera. So um, I welcome you. I hope everyone will participate in, in our question segments and the discussion time. And I, I just want to acknowledge to everyone here that we know everyone has something to say. And um, we, we welcome bringing as much of that here as we can. So thank you. Hi, everyone. My name's Deldi Reyes, and I work for Cal EPA in the Environmental Justice Program. Can I just see a show of hands for folks who came here tonight that are not working in California? Great, that's awesome. So the one thing I just want to point out, uh, you heard reference already to this, but I want to just make a, a little bit of a point about it. In, that, in the back there, we have our posters about Cal EnviroScreen, 
which is a tool developed um, by Cal EPA in the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment. You're gonna hear a lot more about that from our speakers. Um, and also, we have a poster about EJ Screen, which is US EPA's nationally consistent tool for um, investigating environmental justice. So the reason I asked about who was here from outside of California is there are a number of states across the country that are working on developing very similar approaches. So if you happen to be with one of those in one of those states, that's wonderful. Um, we've got some examples back there that you can um, think about. Um, if your state is not um, doing a, a tool like that, then uh, perhaps these could offer um, paths forward. So we encourage you to talk to our, our two wonderful folks back there, Yolanda Sanchez and Laura August, and also we have fact sheets about the tools too. Thanks. Well, good evening, everyone, and, uh, and thank you so much for uh, coming um, to be part of this uh, uh, EJ Roundtable and Town Hall with us. Um, uh, and um, I have the honor, the distinct honor, of uh, introducing the speakers here, uh, and I'm going to do them individually uh, for, uh, as, uh, uh, for when they come up and speak. So the first one uh, that I want to introduce is uh, Diane Tagvorian. Um, and uh, she is the executive director of the Environmental Health Coalition right here in San Diego. And um, it is largely because of, of their work, EHC's work, uh, that I have thought about uh, how to tell uh, the EJ story in California uh, being in three phases. Uh, first, um, working uh, at the community level building community capacity and building community-driven models, and then um, uh, building political power and uh, uh, influencing the legislative process. And then lastly, uh, thirdly, uh, implementation of cutting-edge programs. Um, and Diane has been intimately involved in all three phases. So we are truly uh, fortunate to have her kick off uh, this event today. Thank you, Charles. I'm honored to be here, and thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I guess I'm your official welcomer to San Diego, so I'm so glad that you're all here and to know that so many of you are uh, from outside of California. Uh, and I also want to say that there are many, many environmental justice heroes in this room. So um, my hat goes off to all of you, and I I'm appreciative of all of you and for the hard work that you've all done uh, for these many decades, including Charles, who uh, actually kicked off, if you don't know, by writing the Toxic Waste and Race Report in 1985, six, sorry, uh, and well, I was close. Um, I was in the right decade and it really uh, launched a movement. I really appreciate the work of the committee um, to help us to be here tonight and I don't want to start on a negative note, but I'm going to have to bring some reality to our convening today uh, before I start on my prepared comments. And I want to tell you this because I feel like everyone needs to know that you, uh, all of us that are in the environmental justice movement, have to be warriors. We are survivors in many ways. And on Saturday morning at 12.30 a.m., uh, one of our allies' offices was uh, torched, uh, was firebombed, actually. And their T-shirts were uh, brought out on the lawn and burned. Their office was destroyed. And this is ACE, which is a statewide organization, and we have a very powerful uh, ally, in a partner in, in San Diego and Chula Vista. So I want you to know that we are in this struggle, but this is not without risk. This is not without risk of physical and human uh, abuse and attack. And tomorrow morning, we're having a press conference with all the progressive environmental and social justice organizations in San Diego. And I, I'm, I don't mean to start negatively, but I think we need to get grounded in the reality that we're living in today and how important this work is for all of us. So I think they and we all appreciate your thoughts. And, uh, and good wishes for them and your, your work in the struggle continuing on. So I wanna say that, um, I'm gonna use this. And to say that 
Of course, we all know what environmental justice is, and I want to say that while they're not here in the room today, our community uh, allies and our community leaders are with us today in this room, as well as the environmental justice heroes. And I think my job, as Charles said, is to really talk about what it takes to do environmental justice work, not only here in California, but throughout the country and actually throughout the world. And as I always kind of say, environmental justice uh, folks have to do it all, from local organizing to, I didn't do that, from local organizing to the, their own community-based research, to policy advocacy, to state policy. And that's the trajectory that I want to take you on today, because it's important for you to know that community solutions are the ones that often work very well at the local, state, and national level. And environmental justice groups are really behind a lot of the work that's happening across the country, and it all starts on the ground. And it certainly all starts with our goal for healthy neighborhoods. And our children are most at risk. And that's true throughout the country in every environmental justice community. This map of San Diego, which shows you where the highest asthma rates are, which is in low-income communities of color, could be anywhere in an environmental justice community across the country. We all have this map to show you. High cancer rates, high asthma rates, high respiratory disease rates. And it's something that we share uh, and something that we're fighting against. The other thing that I think we often share is in our communities, we have what we call incompatible land uses or discriminatory zoning, which allows homes and schools to be right next to um, factories that are polluting, next to ports that have lots of air pollution coming from them. There are uh, explos explosion risks uh, that occur in these neighborhoods. Here in National City with the plume that's on your right, uh, this is a fire that occurred on a Sunday morning right in a residential neighborhood because this auto body shop was located right in the residential neighborhood. Fortunately, no one was hurt, but the auto body shop exploded um, on a Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Uh, we're looking at communities where we have a high degree of diesel trucks that are coming in and out as a result of port activity or other kind of goods movement activity. Again, incompatible land uses, accidents. Uh, the, the one picture with the ship is, uh, is a real picture <laughs> with uh, the ship that's unloading cars at the port of San Diego at the National City Terminal right next to a park. And that's where our children have to play. So we all know that these are signs of environmental racism and that these are situations that need to be repaired. Here we look at uh, land use in West National City where you see all the red areas are industrial, yellow are um, residential and commercial, and these are areas that are mixed. And these are the, one of the um, things that we have worked on very hard to begin to, sh to change. We think, again, it starts at the community level, that community members, as they say, are on the front lines of the impact, but we're also on the front lines of the solution. And these two women, being very active in National City, helped to create the West Side Specific Plan, which was adopted in 2010, that actually separated uh, in zoning uh, polluting uses and homes and schools. And it also did something else. It adopted, uh, the city council adopted what we called an amortization ordinance, which actually gives the city the power to relocate or phase out uh, polluting uses like auto body shops and plating shops that are located right next to homes and schools because they became non-conforming uses. So these are successes that we were able to achieve on the ground. And so Environmental Health Coalition was able to then share that information through a community training program um, about community planning and also through a video. And then as a result of that, we were able to pass one of the first environmental justice elements in the state of California in National City in 2011. As a result of that, the California Environmental Justice Alliance was able to get a, a green zones measure passed, which actually allowed uh, SB 1000 to be passed in 2016, which requires that 
all cities in the state of California uh, institute an environmental justice element. So going from local organizing to regional policy to state policy was really the goal and something that we are, we're very proud of and excited that we were able to bring the Green Zones uh, picture to all cities in the state of California. And then from Green Zones, we were able to work with the state of California and with our allies across the, across the state in environmental justice communities to go to transformative climate communities, which actually identifies those communities, again, they're green zones, environmental justice communities, whatever you wanna call them, they are the communities that have the most impacts as a result of polluting industries and from greenhouse gases. And we were able to um, get AB 2722 uh, passed, which actually allocates millions of dollars to those communities for investments that can begin to reduce greenhouse gases, as well as to improve infrastructure and invest in communities. One of the ways that that occurred in in uh, National City here in San Diego was $9 million from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund was able to be put into the Paradise Creek apartments. So you see on the bottom here uh, the Paradise Creek which runs through, uh, excuse me, West National City and there used to be a bus depot and um, an operations yard for the city of National City that was quite polluting. But we envisioned that there could be 200 affordable housing units, and that came to pass when the GGRF funds actually were able to plug the last $9 million gap of this uh, $50 million uh, project so that 200 families now have homes. They're all very affordable and it's all national city residents as a result of a policy we were able to get passed. So that's the kind of thing that can happen on the ground when we have environmental justice communities that are in, empowered and trained and also working with community uh, organ housing organizations. Uh, one of the other things that we were able to do uh, was to get AB 1288 passed in 2015. And as a result of this introduction of this bill and adoption of this bill by uh, then um, Speaker Tony Atkins of the State Assembly, we were able to get two members of the environmental justice communities uh, appointed to the California Air Resources Board. And I was privileged to be one of those people. So I am currently serving on the Air Resources Board and that's something that we think is very important that environmental justice voices are actually on the boards that are making these decisions about regulations in, in California and throughout the state. So I'm gonna stop there and uh, at, take your questions about anything I've shared with you, and then I'm just gonna say a few words about Cal Enviro Screen uh, before Arsenio is, uh, comes up. And I'd just like to say that um, we have three mics placed here, so we'd appreciate it if you jump up and run over to one of the mics so that everyone can hear you. Otherwise, we'll have to be repeating questions. Um, I'd also like to say that, as you probably noticed, we started the program a little bit late because it took people a while to find this place. And so <clears throat> the food is already here, though. So um, I think it would be, if you want to wander over and have some food while you're listening, I think that's okay. Because okay, it's, you know, we're going to run a little over, too. We're probably down at 8.15. Okay, so who has a question or a comment? I just want to hear, hear a little bit more from what she has to say. That might be okay, too. I can't see you at all, so I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's light. Here it's very go. bright. One over here. <coughs> Hi, Diana. I'm Shayla Serpis, hey, uh, Shayla. family doctor here in San Diego. I just want to thank you. That was so articulate and so rapid, and I appreciate that maybe people are from out of the area and not too familiar with the region. So um, I think working together with the medical community and um, showing those same maps and how um, chronic disease and other things besides asthma, like childhood obesity. Um, so I just want to say that the Environmental Health Coalition has done an outstanding job in um, also working with the medical community and the school districts to improve the wellness of the entire community. And I just want to thank you for being so articulate and laying that out so clearly. Thank you, Shayla. Dr. Sherpas is one of our heroes, um, environmental justice heroes here in uh, San Diego and in the South Bay. She uh, works every day to repair the damage that's been done um, to our kids and to our families as a result of this pollution. So thank you, Shayla. Appreciate it. In Philadelphia. Uh, you mentioned something about amortization as a method for getting rid of polluters in, a, in the community. 
And I don't know how that works. Could you explain that? I, I can. Um, I went right by it. Let me get there. So we were able to get an ordinance passed which actually gives power to the city council to what they would, what we would call amortize a non-conforming use. So in the west side of National City, we got a new community plan adopted, which changed the zoning. So rather than having what was then mixed use, which was industrial, residential, and commercial, it changed to residential and commercial. So there were still industrial uses there. They then became non-conforming uses. And we were able to, with the help of actually EPA, uh, US EPA, we were able to get uh, resources for the city of National City to create a ranking program. Uh, they ranked more than 100 of the polluting uses in this small west side of National City as to which ones were the most uh, risky for the community's health. And then the city started at the top of the list to say, those uh, businesses would be valued in terms of what their value was and how long they would have to actually be phased out of the community. So two of those businesses have actually been phased out and uh, they're hoping to take action on the next five uh, in 2019. So I, I'm sorry to do this, but I'm gonna ask you to go back to your presentation now okay. and move on. And we'll have a little bit of time for questions at the end of this panel. So one of the most uh, stunning things I think that well, we were, we've been able to do in California, and I know a lot of you are, are very aware of this, is the adoption of Cal the Cal Enviro screen. And Arsenio Mataka is gonna come up in just a minute and talk to you about um, really the, the history of that and how important that is to, to our communities. But I wanted to kind of take you back to pre-Arsenio, well, not pre-Arsenio's life, but uh, <laughs> pre-Arsenio in state government, uh, when the first environmental justice laws were passed in the state of California in the late 1990s and environmental justice was defined, there was also the establishment of the Cal EPA Environmental Justice Advisory Committee. And I had the privilege of uh, co-chairing that committee. And one of the things that came out of uh, that committee with 150 recommendations was that we define cumulative impacts to be what you're seeing on the screen. And we also said that cumulative impacts should not only be identified, but that we should identify those communities that are most at risk and we should begin to prioritize our programs, our regulations, and our investments towards those communities. And we, had, we, we started to think about that uh, long before 2004, just like all the rest of you have thought about the fact that the communities that are most impacted by pollution are also impacted by um, other health outcomes, uh, uh, low education, we have low voting, we have linguistic isolation, we've got um, substandard housing, we've got kids that are growing up in unhealthy environment, lack of green space, you know what the list is. So we knew that we knew what those communities are, but we didn't have a more scientific and health-based way of identifying them. So as the state was kind of gearing up to begin to do that, uh, there's a team that you see here on the screen from uh, Ra Rachel Morella Frosch and Manuel Pastor, right there. Thank you, Manuel, um, who came together to develop the environment, environmental justice screening method. And then, because they are the um, academics uh, who care about the community and want to involve the community, Environmental Health Coalition and other environmental justice groups across the state were involved with them and we actually did what we called ground truthing. So they collected the data that they could get their hands on and we took it out into the communities and said, is that right? Um, is that factory actually there? Is there a school there? Is there a house there? And then that data was able to be, um, to be changed and, uh, and fixed. And I don't think anyone thought it was perfect, but it was pretty close. Um, and it really reflected what we live on the ground every day. And so this was the first map uh, that we were able to identify. And Joy Williams, our uh, research director, is here. And this is her map uh, that she was able to develop from that first data. And then Cal Enviro Screen began to be developed. And this is uh, the beginning of Cal Enviro Screen 
And this is where I step off and Arsenio steps on because this was the beginning of what we saw as, the, as what Cal Enviro Screen would be comprised of as we began to see that for the entire state of California. Thank you. So now you know why um, we were so excited when, um, when Diane agreed to be the speaker here. And, um, so let me um, go on to our next one speaker, um, Arsenio Mataka, who is the, uh, currently the environmental advisor to Attorney General uh, Xavier Becerra. Uh, and, but for the last five years, or more than, the, more than five years, he's been the Assistant Secretary for Environmental Justice and Tribal Affairs for the California Environmental Protection Agency. And it was during that time that uh, he spearheaded many of the advances in institutionalizing environmental justice in California state government. Um, Arsenio is a role model uh, for young people in the audience, especially um, who want to make a difference with their careers. He not only can tell us the backstory of uh, how all this got to be done in California government but he is truly a pioneer uh, and a source of inspiration. Thank you. Discriminatory <laughs> Well, it's a real honor to be here today. Um, I look out into the crowd and um, what Amy mentioned is there's plenty of people that could come up here today and, and provide um, equally or if not better information, than we're, but we're going to try our best. Before I get into Cal and Virus Screen, I wanted to give a little bit of a story. And um, I want to tell the story since we're in San Diego. I have this um, vivid memory of being a, a, a child and playing at home in, you know, at our house in the living room carpet while well, my mother and father would play a record of what the record player now looks like a, a dresser. It's, it's, it's a large record player. Um, see, the, old, the older folks laughed because they knew what I was talking about. Um, there was a particular song that always seemed to be on repeat. The song would start with a, a gentle guitar and then it'd be joined by a marimba, which is like a, a xylophone, and some Congo drums. And it was like a samba, and it started, it started like this. In the year of 1970, in the city of San Diego, under the Coronado Bridge, lied a little piece of land. A little piece of land that the Chicano community of Logan Heights wanted to make into a park. A park where all the chavalitos could come and play in, so they wouldn't have to play in the street and get run over by a car. A park where the viejitos could come in the tarde, the evening, and just sit down and watch the sun go down. A park where all the familias could come and just get together on a Sunday afternoon and celebrate the spirit of life itself. But the city of San Diego said, chale, we're going to make a highway patrol substation here. So on April 22, 1970, La Raza of Logan Heights and other Chicano communities got together and they walked on the land and they took it over with their picks and their shovels and they began to build their own park. And today, almost now 50 years later, that little piece of land under the Coronado Bridge and here in San Diego is known to everyone as Chicano Park. Now, that, that's, there's a famous song I just read you a famous song. It's called Chicano Park by Los Alacranes. Um, I couldn't come to San Diego and talk about what we we're going to talk about without mentioning this song. I'm going to go ahead for a second and then come back to Cal Virus Screen. Um, this slide here, this is a famous TED Talk, a really famous person who talks about communicating from the inside out about how you should communicate from your purpose, from your belief first, and then work your way out. And if you can do that, you can really effectuate change. That what you do um, is well-centered, and um, you have a good chance to, to make it happen. 
And this slide here, it's, the gentleman's name is Simon Sinek. He, like, he's a big TED Talk person. He claims that people, organizations, and businesses, and government institutions usually act from the outside in. Um, they say what they do. Um, we say how we're good at doing things before we say what we believe. We usually act and communicate from the outside in. But in 1970, for the inspired Chicano community here in San Diego, they sought action from the inside out. So starting with why, the why, they're, clearly their purpose in that song was to illustrate that the purpose of their belief was that the kids, the elderly, and families should be able to play, live, be happy in a safe and peaceful manner. How did they do that? They took direct action. In this case, they took over the park with their picks and shovels. And what did they get? Well, the result was they got Chicano Park. Now, many movements and struggles have started with the park. I'm from the San Joaquin Valley. Um, of what the, the, the late civil rights um, leader Tom Hayden would call the spine of California. So if you can imagine the spine of California, that's where I'm from. And this is my home. And one of my first memories of activism for change was when my parents fought for a park similar to that in Chicano Park. In my community, my parents and other residents wanted a park because the, neighbors, the neighborhood kids were playing football in a, in a cemetery. I'm ashamed to say that I, too, played football in that historic cemetery, trampling over markers of people who had been dead for over 100 years. But my parents, who were young Chicano activists here in San Diego State in 1973, brought that learned experience of Chicano Park to my small town of 750 people. And like Chicano Park, they demanded and ultimately prevailed in getting a park. So my friends and I didn't have to play in the cemetery, right? But that wasn't the only thing going on in my community. As the, as the um, image shows, we couldn't drink our water. The water the water system to this day still is, you know, sometimes fails levels. It's getting better, but was frequently out of compliance with safe drinking level standards. Um, as a child, it was common to be out on recess. recess. There's a picture of my school in the middle, um, right underneath the O and home. And you can see there's a crop, you can't really see it, but there's a crop duster landing pad there. And we would frequently have um, crop dusters spraying near the surrounding fields while we were at school. Pesticides, of course. Um, and, sorry, I, I'll just go around. And so, um, not to mention we had other um, environmental impacts like um, those tires that you see. Um, unfortunately, we have the, the privilege of being one of the largest tire piles in the world uh, when I was growing up, and we burned those tires for electricity. And then to the south there is another incinerator where we would burn our trash, again, for electricity. And so going back to Cal Enviro's screen, I said all that because when I would go to, with my parents to these local government meetings, whether it's a city council or a board of supervisors, and they would share that story, those images, with leaders decision makers at the dais, the people in charge of making these decisions for a broader community, they would always get cast aside and get sort of ridiculed or either just like um, told that, oh, well, that's just anecdotal information that doesn't have any science base to it. We all have it bad here. You don't have it any worse than any of us. And therefore, their, their sort of input was never acknowledged and the vote was always unanimous and seemed to go always against the community. And so fast forward, I then get this privilege to come to the California Environmental Protection Agency. And to be quite honest, I wasn't very enthused because I saw that as an agency that has failed my communities and other communities. But I saw something there that they were up to, and it was through the work of a lot of the folks here in the room that already laid the groundwork. There was something going on with respect to cumulative impacts. And I saw that and I saw my home. And I saw something that could be worked on that I felt really passionately about that we could do something about. 
So this is my how as we look at Cal and Viroscreen. And I'm gonna to get to that in a second. But here was an opportunity. It was an opportunity, sorry, this, this thing gets out of sort. Um, with Cal and Viroscreen, and I say we because it's, it's, it's the academics like Manuel and Rachel Morello Frosch, the community members, myself as a kid coming from this community, and now the agency that I was going to, we were driven by this belief that if we could somehow quantify the load, of the burden of pollution that people were catching hell from, that we could change the course and the future of these communities forever. That was the belief. We, we really, I believe that. And so as we go along the process of developing this tool, a cumulative impact tool called Cal and Bioscreen, that was our center point. That's how we were working from the inside. Now, how are we gonna do that? These were my sort of principles that I thought, if we're gonna do this, you know, we have to have something that's science-based, because I saw what my parents went through when something wasn't science-based, it didn't work, right? You know, decision makers didn't respond to that. It had to be informed by community experience, as Diane said. Communities had been doing this for a much longer time than these agencies. They knew where these communities were at. We just really needed to put the data behind it. And there were also academic teams that had already been well ahead of us at this time of Cal EPA of doing this work. The third bullet point was really important to me. I wanted the government to endorse it, and I wanted them to utilize it. I, and this is where we struggled a bit because I believed that if we, they didn't endorse it, if the, my own agency did not endorse it, it was going to become another tool that sits somewhere that doesn't see the action that it deserves. And it was important to have it available statewide to everybody. No matter if you're up on the top at Eureka or, or at the bottom of Imperial County, everybody like my community should have the chance to know what type of pollution is in their community and how does their vulnerability, the people there, affect the way they deal with that pollution. And so we sought out by doing a thorough public participation of which we benefited from the work that the communities had already done. And then we served, at, and we was, I was hopeful at least that it would serve as a third party validator. So if I had to go back in time, my folks would have, who don't, we didn't have any universities or any think tanks near where we went to, where I grew up, that they would have this opportunity to show, say, hey, this is not just us saying this, this is the state of California saying this. Maybe that could get the attention. And so these are some of the, the sort of struggles um, that we went through. Um, the state government had to acknowledge that these communities exist. A big, big deal. Do you think states normally like to show maps that show where the, the highest pollution burdens are and, and where those happen to be are where people of color live and poor people? No. We had to convince state government that it was the right thing to do. The community, as you just said, Manuel and them had created a tool that was far advanced and superior to Cal and Virus Screen, and the community had already been working on it. And they had to sort of hand off that, transfer that knowledge to a government agency and work with us. That wasn't easy. And then we have local government, who I went through numerous meetings with the League of Cities, with all these local government people who were extremely um, fearful and would often tell me, what are they going to do with this information? How is it going to be used? It's only going to create problems for us. And then the scientists, the scientists who would be asked to build a scientific tool, but at the same time have that tool rooted in a community experience. That's a challenge for the scientists. And industry, of course, and their prioritization, they, they were really fearful that this was going to be used to stop permits, to stop um, certain things, and, and get involved in enforcement. Um, they were kind of okay with it being a prioritization tool, but they didn't want it making its way into the framework of permitting and enforcement. And then business, now here's the kicker. Business feared that the tool would be used to redline communities from economic development. Now, if you know anything about redlining communities and sort of 
what communities went through when they were really redlined, and then to have somebody come back and tell you that they're so concerned about these communities that of their economic development that they're fearful of them getting redlined, we had to do some education on what redlining was. <laughs> and that was fun. <laughs> so I'm gonna, we're gonna get, I'm gonna get cut off here, but this is what we ended up accomplishing. It's a tool, it's a simple mapping tool called Cal Screen. It looks at pollution and it looks at vulnerability and it puts them together and it ranks every census tract in the state of California against each other and it shows us which communities are high and which communities are low. And now we use, now we use those maps to, gener to take money and put it in these communities. As you saw that affordable housing unit, that comes from these maps pointing to those communities. $2 billion from our cap and trade funds go to these communities. Enforcement initiatives have been started that focus on these communities. And now I, at the Department of Justice, use these maps and this information to weave them into our legal arguments. I'm going to leave that there. Great. I got shorter just now. <laughs> Does anyone, we can take one or two quick questions if anyone would like to pose one. You have to be, you have to be spry though. Okay, well let's proceed then. I, you were right, I was wrong. <laughs> Great. Well, um, you just heard the tip of the iceberg from Arsenio, and so um, you can have a chance to talk to him more later. Our third speaker um, is uh, Luis Omedo, and he is the executive director for Comité Civico del Valle, uh, whose motto is, inform people, create healthier communities. And uh, for several decades, Luis has worked to address the multiple environmental and public health issues in the border region. Um, for example, uh, Comité Civico uh, helped to build a network of some 40 community-based uh, air monitors in Imperial County. Um, and um, when he first joined um, our planning process, uh, he sent me this list of the, his partners, and it was just an amazing list. Uh, so, um, uh, Luis um, is going to tell us about his work, uh, and I would like you to hear from him about how empowered communities are pioneering uh, cutting-edge community citizen science through partnerships that connect the dots between public health, planning, and the environmental disciplines. Thank you, Charles, for that intro. And uh, what, what I'm going to share with you, it's not much different than what Arsenio shared with you or what Diane has shared with you, perhaps uh, pretty identical. Um, the fact that uh, a couple of decades ago I was introduced to environmental justice, uh, it really made a lot of sense as to the efforts that we started with as an organization working on civic engagement, working on a lot of social justice issues that disenfranchised the, the, the community, particularly the farm worker population at that time in the early 2000s, uh, got to better understand that environmental justice was, uh, had a, a history of a long, far struggle that created mechanisms to help communicate with those from public health or government or others that can help bring resources and services and help contribute to improving the quality of life and solving some of these challenges that we face in environmental justice communities. This is a map of the Imperial Valley. Do I need to point right at it? There we go. So there's a, there's a lot of issues that affect uh, the community in disproportionate ways. And some of them affect us all. Uh, in particular, like for example, um, I'm going to go through a few slides that will highlight a few issues. Uh, water is life, and water is also an economic um, uh, engine for our valley. Without water, we would just be a desert. And although be deserts are beautiful, it would not be able to uh, foster and um, support uh, the economics 
the economic engine that it is. Uh, agriculture is a huge economic engine, and coming from a farm worker family, uh, we know how important that is to putting food on our tables. I've had the privilege and opportunity to work on the fields and got to experience the good and the very serious issues that affect the quality of life and the public health. Uh, water, in most recently, and uh, as, as part of some of the policies that have been passed, uh, it brings a lot of awareness, a lot of knowledge to our communities. For example, like the human right to water is a very important piece of legislation. Uh, who knew that getting clean, uh, affordable water to communities and to everybody uh, was important? Water is life. And water is an ex extremely important element to maintaining our health. Um, we're very fortunate to have support uh, and partners because without having partners, it's very difficult to really do much um, on our own. And um, we recently started a, a study to better understand what the conditions of, of water that are being uh, supplied to homes were. And, uh, and although there's a lot of data, a lot of times it's really hard to better understand how that data really translates into what the uh, community is receiving. You know, uh, all we know is we want to turn on the faucet and we want to get clean water. That's what community wants. And um, why this is very important and, and, and why I think it's very important to, to, should be very important to public health is that um, as, as we were doing a study, there's been a lot of concerns, a lot of concerns from industry. Because like I said, water is very important to to the production of food. The Imperial Valley is one of the most important uh, areas of production, and as, well, as well as the Central Valley. And it would be detrimental to our economy that we would somehow inadvertently affect our economy. But we cannot be afraid of being able to gather data. That is extremely important. And it's extremely important that people who do have the knowledge whether it's the farmers who have been there for 100 years, whether it's our water and public utility, the scientists, the state agencies, everybody who has some knowledge to come together to be able to collect the data that we need so that we can better understand what are the solutions that we need for our communities. And Arsenio's right. A lot of times, and, and as well as um, Deanne, you know, we are going to get attacked. But you know what? We're not the enemies. We are just trying to be part of that solution. And, uh, and I think it's important to have these open dialogues and these, these healthy dialogues to be able to find and understand what is everybody's fear and how can we move past that fear. One of the things that I really find astonishing is that just a couple of years ago, there was an enormous amount of participation and support from the federal government. And overnight, it's gone. Where is that support? And I think that's going to be very important to keep asking that question. Is that support there for public health? Is that support there for environmental justice? I have not seen it. It's gone. So what we have today is the state, and I'm glad that Arsenio here is on behalf of the Attorney General's office who has been a champion for environmental justice. And, um, and as we move forward, nobody should be in fear of being able to go out there and be part of collecting data and be part of finding solutions so that we can improve public health for everybody, not just for a select few, not just for the person who has the dollars to be able to spend thousands of dollars so that they can get clean water, but for everybody, even for that person who can't afford it because they're making less than minimum wage. And there are people that make less than minimum wage. Another issue that we face in the Imperial Valley is the Salton Sea. Uh, this is uh, an, ex an enormous problem that this, the state uh, needs to be more involved with, and they have been more in, in, in the last uh, few years. Um, but this is something that affects the entire Southern California. And, you know, I, I know that uh, numbers that I've seen, up to 100 miles, uh, there have been detection of, of sources of pollution coming from the Salton Sea. Uh, we're very close to Mexico as well. This is a, this is a big issue. Um, and so what, some of the things that we're doing out there is um, 
So the state and, and local authorities have come together to put together a salt and sea mitigation plan. Uh, there are some short-term and long-term goals. Some of the short-term goals is dust suppression. We want to make sure that that dust does not go airborne and affect uh, public health. Imperial Valley already suffers from PM 2.5, PM 10. We don't meet federal standards. Uh, there is still, however, uh, a lot more support needed. Uh, the Imperial Valley, although we have um, very effective legislators, uh, we don't have as many legislators as some of the more urban uh, uh, metropolitan areas do. You know, we have one assembly member, one senator, uh, we have one congressman on the southern end, one congressman on the, on the northern end. Uh, and, and although they have been championing, they have been doing a phenomenal job in taking a leadership role and bringing more monies into the Salton Sea, there is more work ahead to be able to mitigate that. It is unfortunate that the Salton Sea is now just becoming uh, a, a subject of greater awareness to our community. Okay, and the fact is we have over 85% population is Latino, um, monolingual. Uh, a lot of the population who are there do not, have not had the privilege of, a lot of the population, not all, but a lot of the population had not had the privilege to be given the opportunity or afford the opportunity to understand the ecological treasure that the Salton Sea once was and can still be. And that is important. And some of the things that we're working on is making sure that agencies like the natural resources agencies, they adopt policies of public health, they adopt policies of environmental justice because they are tasked with bringing solutions to helping mitigate the, sea, the, 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 the conditions of the sea, as well as the habitat, as well as the wildlife. I've, we've only seen it as, as an impaired sea. And only until recently, until there's been more education and more support. In fact, we are now participating in, in contributing to that effort to reach the hard reach populations who have never ever thought of the Salton Sea as a place to go have a picnic, as a place to go fishing, as a place to go boating. All right? Those aren't the, the type of amenities and type of privileges that we had had historically in our community. Yet, if you look at the history, this was a hot spot for uh, the Hollywood stars that would go and enjoy the sea at, at one point in time when, when it was considered to be a, a, a hot spot for, for recreation. And only today we're starting to see that there's more awareness and, and, and more knowledge and we want to save the sea. Who would have thought that in our backyard we had such an ecological treasure? Uh, we have other issues as well as, um, uh, like I said, air quality. There's a lot of sources of air quality. Uh, although agricultural burning always is the, you know, the thing that gets the most attention when uh, if you're up close and you see it, it almost seems like a kind of mushroom uh, type of effect uh, that you would see in, in perhaps nuclear type of, of, uh, of explosions. But um, it's, it's actually not the largest source of emissions, it's actually particulate matter, dust coming from uh, either from vehicle emissions, coming from uh, tilling, coming from the desert. Uh, there's a lot of sources of emission that exist and we have failed to meet federal clean air standards. And although Imperial has uh, done an enormous effort of trying to change their policies, bringing in uh, a diverse number of interventions, we are next to Mexico who, it, uh, if we are a couple hundred thousand in population, Mexico is uh, closer to two million. I mean, I, I don't know if anybody's done a more recent census, but uh, it's a real huge contrast. A lot of times we get considered as though we're, we're rural. We're not rural by no definition. We maybe look rural, but we have the metropolitan impact because a, a border fence, a political line does not stop pollution coming from Mexico. And that brings me to international border. There's a lot of efforts happening today in the international border. Uh, most recently, the California Air Resources Board, and we have a board member here, which I really thank for that, uh, had given direction to the California Air Resources Board to not just ad adopt what they call state implementation plans. These plans get adopted whenever uh, an area does not meet the federal standards for clean air. And so they have to put a plan of how we're gonna achieve that, uh, uh, those uh, measures of the Clean Air Act, how we're gonna be in compliance. And this is the first time actually that the state says, you know, we're gonna approve your, your PM 2.5 plan. But however, you have to create an, a, a plan as well as how you, uh, there's gonna be a collaboration by nationally to be able to address some of these other emissions coming from Mexico that are the control of the local authorities in the county and the state. And so uh, this has led into 
uh, some additional efforts such as uh, an outreach campaign uh, that in, in the holiday seasons, there's a lot of tradition. I know that because I was born in Mexico. Uh, so I know that there's a tradition of doing fireworks. In fact, when I was younger, we used to shoot those bottle rockets to each other's neighbors. That was like, who would think of doing that nowadays? But we would do that all the time. And by the time it was midnight and everybody celebrating in such a joyful time, uh, I think it'd be like, 10, 15 minutes after 12, and you, nobody could see, and everybody would run inside, and everybody would be choking, and, and the emissions were just so thick and so bad between the bonfires, between the fireworks. Uh, and so a lot of that has changed in education and, and PSAs and other things that are happening in Mexico, in Mexicali and our side. I'm not sure if it's happening in, in, you know, in San Diego, um, uh, Tijuana, but... Uh, uh, you know, these, there's a lot of positive that's happening. We're starting to better understand the shifts in politics as well in Mexico. Uh, you know, but more than anything, there's, there's, there's a work table that is happening right now where we're able to discuss of how we can better improve uh, air quality on both sides of the border because Mexico complains about ag burning uh, drifting into, them, into their side, and we complain about vehicle emissions coming into our end. Uh, one of the things that, that are uh, very significant is that Mexico now wants to do more community monitoring. Uh, it's an affordable way to get more data points and to be able to put more data in real time, and that's one of the projects that I think that the Air Resources Board will be supporting here very soon. Uh, I kind of spoke about this already. Um, AB 617 is a significant piece of legislation. Uh, a couple years ago, back in uh, 20, uh, 27, no, yeah, 2017, uh, we had a couple of uh, bills. Uh, one was a bill that uh, Senator Kuhn, U.S. Senator Kuhn had presented, which was a, a citizen science and crowdsourcing bill. And uh, another one was uh, we wanted to make sure that we institutionalize community monitoring. We set ourselves out to uh, launch a 40 monitor network in the Imperial Valley that measures PM10, PM2.5. How am I, am I good in time? No, am I, am I? okay. So I'll be wrapping it up here. <laughs> Once I get started talking, I... So uh, as part of an NIH grant, there was a, a $2 million grant uh, awarded to the um, uh, Public Health Institute, uh, the um, uh, um, a program that uh, we work with, California Tracking. And this allowed us to, oh, in partnership with University of Washington, we were able to set out 40 air monitors. And one of the things that was really important, and this is really a key word, is that we would always get pushback. Whether it was crowdsourcing, whether it was citizen science, there was always pushback. They didn't want to do any of this. And it says, you have to institutionalize it. You have to institutionalize it. it was, what, what does all that mean? And uh, well, now I understand what institutionalizing means. It means that you legislate it, and, and, and the legislature forces uh, state agencies to just do it and, and gives them direction to do it. So if that's the way to institutionalize it. This is a very successful effort at, at 617. Hopefully we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about that. Uh, so I'll just kind of go through this. This is by natural. Uh, Calum virus screen's been widely discussed. And um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, these are all communities that have been uh, funded so far. $50 million in grants that are out there. 10 million have been given out as of now. Uh, and it's gonna help these uh, uh, areas that are shaded here from Imperial, San Diego, Los Angeles, the um, Inland Empire, the Central Valley, the Bay Area. Uh, this is a very significant amount of investment. There hasn't been this much of investment in environmental justice from government uh, since I can remember the last couple of decades. So I'll just stop there. Thank you. So, so we have a few minutes for uh, comments and questions from the floor. If anyone would like to make a comment or ask a question to uh, Luis or any members of our panel. I know we're all also anxious to hear the next speaker, so. Um. I don't know. Hi. Uh, my name is Olympia Beltran. I'm a registered nurse. I work in South Bay. I'm also here uh, with Environmental Health Coalition. I am a resident of Barrio Logan. Um, an advocate for clean water and clean air. Um, right now, I'm serving on a steering committee for air quality in Barrio Logan. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, there was a reference made uh, to a catchphrase that was used at Standing Rock. I heard water is life in the last presentation. And given that um, 
I was a volunteer medic at Standing Rock. I was a volunteer medic at the Bayou Bridge Pipeline. Um, I would like to know what the panelists feel is the role of public health workers in front lines activism. I mean, it's one thing to use the catchphrases while indigenous communities are taking a lot of risks and putting their bodies on the line for fresh water and fresh air and fresh soil. Um, but I saw very few professionals join that fight. And I put a call out to my peers and very few joined me. So um, I do understand that this work is extremely important or else I wouldn't be doing it off the front lines. This is extremely important to have that balance of direct action on the front lines as well as um, the legis legislation. But I would like to know what the panelists feel is the role of public health workers in direct action and frontline work. Hello, hello, is it on? Uh, so I haven't even spoken yet, but uh, my name is Mo and I'm a pediatrician in Flint, Michigan. And there is a huge role for academics, for scientists, for, physici for physicians to get out of their silos and to work hand in hand with their communities. And that's a big part of my message. Um, I received an amazing accolade from MIT called the Disobedience Award, which was <laughs> awesome, but very difficult to explain to my children that I got a Disobedience Award. But, but the whole point of that disobedience was I took an academic risk and I, I stepped out of my clinic and I did something that I wasn't supposed to do and, you know, and shared research in a very um, non-traditional way. And if we want to change our communities and if we want to improve public health, um, we need the very credible voice of public health professionals and academia and scientists to work hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder with these disadvantaged communities. And then hopefully, finally, we will create more changes. Just a couple of comments is, um, is one is it's important to, to look at every opportunity you can do community participatory research from a public health perspective. Uh, so there is a huge role, uh, as well as uh, any time that is possible is, is look into research to action. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier about the Salton Sea and uh, one of the reasons it really got us very interested is that for, um, it, you know, back in the early 2000s, there was a, quite a bit of money that had gone to public health and sort of that public health research. And it didn't really lead to a, 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 anything more than just we had a whole lot of information. And one of the things that are happening different now is a lot of the researchers that are still looking at the conditions and the changing conditions is that now they're looking at it from a lens. It's like, how can we solve problems? And that's going to be very important. I mentioned about the water issue, and it's going to be so, it's, it's so important to, to work with the community, but also work with other stakeholders to the extent that they're willing participants. I think that um, that's, that is so important, especially, uh, you know, I don't like the, the term, you know, when it's discussed, oh, water is a thorny issue or it's a contentious issue. No, it shouldn't be, because we're not trying to steal anybody's job or anybody's business or, or, or try to hit anybody's pocket in a way that's going to affect the community. But, it's, but public health is, is such an important uh, part of the overall discussion when we're dealing with elements that affect our health, our bodies, and, and also promote our, our, our ability to live healthy. Also, thanks for the question. I think we have two more questions here, so let's take these two. Uh, my name is Maria Estrada, and I'm an activist, and I'm on the board of the Native Women's Unity Association out of South Dakota. Uh, I'm from C Southeast LA, and I'm actually, uh, my election was on Tuesday, and I'm running against the Speaker of the Assembly of State of California. So I, don't, I won't know the results of my uh, race until the end of the month, but I'm here because uh, in Southeast LA, we want to have one of the worst environmental catastrophes in all of California, and there was a, an ex a plant called Exide, that 700 million pounds of lead went through that plant in 33 years. And um, the Department of Health, Public Health knew, the AQMD knew, Cal OSHA knew. Um, every elected official knew the whole time that this uh, facility was poisoning that community. And so as of right now, even though the plant was closed, um, every official in office is protecting that company. That's a, a multi-billion dollar company. 
Um, my friend here, a scientist, uh, we breached out to 260 homes just in the city of Maywood because we were canvassing for the campaign. And those people don't even know the levels. We only contacted people that had 400 pounds per million or more lead in their homes. And one of the gentlemen was so relieved, and he told me that his wife had had three miscarriages. And he was relieved to hear what was happening because he, he didn't know what was wrong, and it almost cost of their marriage because of all of the turmoil. So there's a, it's a violent attack and an ethnic cleansing that's occurring in Southeast LA, East LA, South Central LA. You have cities like Compton. The water's coming out like coffee. You have cities like Paramount and Compton where seven companies are literally the street over from schools. We have high levels of high rates of uh, lung cancer, um, uh, leukemia, the kids have uh, asthma, env uh, environmental asthma, allergies, and we also have the highest rates of uninsured children and the second high highest rates of uninsured adults. And the issue here is that I'm seeing is that none of the agencies in place to protect the communities are actually doing anything to protect the communities. And all I keep hearing when I go to the AQMD meetings and the, you know, um, Cristina Garcia, Assemblywoman, um, Santiago, Rendon, they, they've, they lie to the community about what's happening, for one. And for two, they, they're, it's very clear that their, their position is to protect these corporations. Um, and I, I know that there's this belief that uh, Donald Trump, and you know, he doesn't care about the environment, but the fact is this is California, and we're run by Democrats. And what's happening here is happening in Flint and all over this country, and these corporations are allowed to poison these communities. So we have hundreds of thousands of families, and these kids have, are born with lead in their systems, and they're going to have behavioral issues and learning disabilities, and they're getting no resources. So I'm running against the Speaker of the Assembly because he's part of that problem. And we need to, uh, uh, you know, the medical field, I'm, I'm just an activist. I've never run for office before. But um, we need to uh, be more, uh, um, help the communities and, and make them more aware of what's happening because these people are struggling right now and they're barely able to get by. So going to a city council meeting or something until 10.30, 11 at night on a Tuesday night is just not possible. Um, and I would like to know what you guys think we should be doing because, I mean, my friend here, she's a scientist. I'm an activist. I'm running for office. It just so happened we hit, you know, this area. So now I'm going to go back and my friend here go to each city and in East L.A., Boyle Heights, you know, not even in my district so that we get more people to become aware. But the, 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 the leaders in the community, none of the organizations are helping us at all. And it's really sad. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. I'm going to give them a chance to respond. Thank you. Yes, Diane. So, um, thank you. I didn't hear your name again. Can you? Maria Estrada. Maria Estrada, thank you. Thanks for your courage to step up and run. Uh, I think it takes a lot uh, for anyone to run for office, and I really appreciate your courage. Uh, the number of women that are running um, and women of color that are running this year has, is astounding. And uh, I think our country is going to be better off for that. So thank you for that. Um, I, I think that we definitely need to speak louder and more clearly to the agencies that are regulating polluters in our, in our communities. And we're, we're in this position of trying to undo decades of neglect and decades of lack of regulation that will allow lead to be in our children's water. I, I just told uh, Dr. Mona today that I got a feed, I was trying to find it for her, that um, we have high levels of lead at uh, Perkins Elementary School, which is in Barrio Logan. Um, and that those results just came out and a couple of other schools. Um, so uh, we, I hear you. Um, I, I get to sit on the California Air Resources Board, and sometimes it's a lonely place to be um, because there isn't that understanding all, always of having lived the experience or working with folks who have. And I, I don't know any way other than to do what you're doing, to run so that you can represent and to get ourselves at those tables so that our voices can be heard and the power can be expanded. That's the way that we got Cal Enviro screen. That was a two-year effort of sitting around a table with a lot of diverse voices so that we could get that cumulative impacts uh, definition done, and then we could get the scientists the money that they needed and the resources that they needed to begin to bring that together. 
I mean, we never had that scientific identification of where those communities were, and now we have literally billions of dollars going um, to those communities for investments and for cleanup, and it's not enough. I mean, there's still Exide, there's still all kinds of um, facilities that are polluting and all kinds of uh, hazardous waste that's in our communities, we have to keep fighting. So I don't have an answer for you. I have an affirmation for you that we need you. We need people in this room to be at their state houses and then their local governments to, to raise their voices. So there isn't one answer, but it has to be all of us together. So again, thank you so much. We have one last question here. So I had a question about uh, Cal Envir uh, EnviroScreen. I had two questions, but just one on uh, Cal EnviroScreen. And that is, how is it being used by government and by uh, community um, groups? That's a, good, that's a great question. Um, so the tool is really, if, if I could describe its use, I would say that the tool has been remarkable in that it has been a, a policy barrier remover. So for decades, when you asked, when you asked um, people to do more enforcement somewhere, um, give some community more attention, give them some more money, for years we were told, oh, well, we just don't know you know, where they go, how are we supposed to pick and choose, all these, you know, um, excuses, really. Um, now with the tool, it, it, has had, it has had the, served the ability to, um, to remove um, those barriers to implement laws, um, implement policies. So there's laws now on place. So going back to, so, one example is um, the cap and trade program that we have here in California where we set limits on carbon and we generate some funds through that and um, that money is available. When I first got to Cal EPA, I was told very quickly that that was money for, for certain purposes and not for EJ communities, flat out. Now, with a combination of the legislature, the community groups and people on the inside pushing, there was then subsequent um, um, laws passed that at least put a backstop and, and said, uh, you know, 25% of that money, because we knew it was going to be hundreds of millions and now billions of dollars, that that certain part of it had to go to these communities. There's one clear example. Um, in my slide, um, I didn't get a chance to do it. Um, half of the money has gone to those communities, so $2 billion on that one program. Diane's group and through the California Environmental Justice Alliance, they they got the 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 nation's largest multifamily solar program in the nation, a billion dollars, and now all that money is going towards those communities. Um, I work with some people in um, the um, on the enforcement side of things, and um, we have enforcement task forces as well as, um, you know, we at the Department of Justice now have an Environmental Justice Bureau, one of our attorneys is here today. Um, and we use the tool to um, enhance our legal arguments, but then also focus our attention on those communities that need the help the most. So in an enforcement, in funding, and that's just at the state level. There are a lot of these, I call them like micro, um, you know, there's, there's these things happening throughout the state where there's a community that we don't know nothing about, that we haven't heard of, that is using this information because it's publicly available to stand up in front of their planning commission or stand up in front of their city council and say, hey, you see this red map here? You know, we, have, we are the highest in the state in asthma. We're in the 100th percentile. Surely adding 2,000 diesel trucks a day is going to really, really put a strain on us. You know, there's all these, you know, multiple, you know, ways in which, which the tool is, is being used. And I could, and I'm sure somebody has here, a long list of laws that have been passed with it. If you just Google um, search it, you could, you could find there's a, a number of laws. And I think it's a unique example of where you've seen a scientific tool make its way to be embedded into several laws and policies 
and at the local stage. I've never, I, you tell me, you point me to a tool or something that has, has, has done that, and I, don't, I, I haven't seen it, at least in California. And so, so that's, um, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of uses. We could, I think there's a sheet in the back that has a multiple um, laws and stuff like that, but that's how, that's how we're using it. And now the Department of Toxic Substances Control, who oversees that Exide cleanup, um, is now looking um, to use information from the tool to enhance its ability to evaluate permits, something that, of course, industry was really um, concerned about, but oh well, that's where we're at now. So I, yeah. I would just also like to point out, if I might, that at the um, Google site that is associated with this, where you've gotten emails about this, and I think we can put the address up again. Some of this information you're talking Good. about, here we go, has already been posted, and perhaps as we collect more resources. So thank, thank you. you for summarizing that yeah. so well. I'm going to thank the panel and then move on to Dr. Mona's talk, which I think is very pertinent as well to a lot of the things that you all have talked about. And then after that, we'll have the town hall. Um, open dis discussion for everyone. So if, if you might join me in thanking this panel for their presentations. Great. Yep, yeah, I'm ready to go. Well, um, we're going to do a little pivot now to our special guest, uh, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha. Uh, and uh, we're, we're, you can't imagine how excited we were when uh, we found out that she agreed to do this uh, to, to do this event, um, and, um, and she is the founder and director of the Pediatric Public Health Initiative of Michigan State University and, Her and Hurley Children's Hospital in Flint, Michigan. Um, she did the science and advocacy that finally got government action to take place during the Flint uh, water crisis. Uh, and she is a true public health hero. Um, when we were looking for someone um, that could link uh, environmental justice and public health, um, we were, um, uh, I guess, uh, a little starstruck when we uh, found out that she was going to be available uh, and that she had agreed. Um, and so, um, because she is, um, um, because her life and her work is the perfect embodiment of how these two issues are, are integrated, integrally connected. Dr. Mona um, is also here to talk about her new book, um, What the Eyes Don't See, A Story of Crisis, Hope, and Resistance in an American City. I get the stool because I'm really short. It's awesome. Thank you for the stool. Um, it is it is amazing and humbling and such an honor to be here um, with really so many heroes uh, in the field of environmental justice. And I want to start by taking you kind of towards the the middle of the Flint story. Um, when I was talking with a, a pediatrician colleague of mine, and he turned to me. Um, we were in the clinic and he turned to me, he's like, Mona, have you ever heard of this concept called environmental injustice or environmental justice? And I just smiled. Um, and I wanna tell you a little bit of my background. Um, we heard some amazing family stories that really um, molded people's careers already today and, and why they do the work that they do. Um, so my path to medicine and to pediatrics was a bit atypical. Um, I started out as a community organizer. Um, I started out as a tree-hugging environmentalist. Um, so I was in high school, um, and I was young. I was 13. Uh, got involved in my high school environmental club, and we did what high schoolers do. We recycled cans, and we put on plays for the elementary school. Um, but then we found out that there was a trash burning incinerator in an adjacent city, and that that incinerator was literally in the backyard of an elementary school and a senior center, and that the kids in that neighborhood had one of the highest asthma rates, and we've heard about this already, and that the adults had high rates of COPD or respiratory disease. So my environmental group leader was amazing, and she got us involved in a real fight. 
in a real environmental fight, and we door knocked, and we protest, and we organized. Um, and this was all led by a courageous mom who was a nurse. And we finally elected um, a local state representative who went into the state legislature, he won, and the very first thing he did was pass a law that an incinerator could not be located that close to an elementary school. And that incinerator has been closed for 20 years. It's amazing, 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 amazing. So I was a kid, I couldn't even drive. My parents would like drop us off to these like protests and like just don't get arrested. Um, but at that young age, I realized the importance of having a voice, of being an activist, the role that environment plays in your health, the impact it has on vulnerable communities, and the power of elected officials to do good. And so I went on, I created my major in environmental health, and then I also realized what, something else that we heard today, that kids are impacted first and impacted disproportionately by environmental burdens. So I went on to be a pediatrician, to, to care for those kids, but very much espousing all of these concepts of environmental health and of environmental justice, environmental and public health. And so when that colleague of mine, after the Flint water crisis had erupted, and said to me, have you heard environmental justice, what that is? Have you ever heard of that concept? I just looked it up on Google. I'm like, of course I have. I've, I've known what it has been and what it is for about a couple decades, because I fortunately went to college at the University of Michigan School of Natural Resources. We have some alum here. And I was blessed to learn about those concepts by some of the fathers of Netfield, Bunyan Bryant, Paul Mohai, who were influenced by Charles Lee's work. So I was blessed to have really that training and really be at the right place at the right time with the right team and the right village um, and the right access to data to do the work that I did in Flint. So obviously you have hopefully heard of, of Flint and our water crisis, and by now you know that it is probably the most emblematic environmental and public health disaster of this young century. It is a story of what happens when the people charged with keeping us safe care more about power and money than they do about us or our children. But I'm here to share that the story of Flint, and you know this by now, is not an isolated story. It is a story of really the deeper crises that we are in right now as a nation. It is a story of what happens when you take away democracy. It is a story of what happens when we deny science, a total disrespect for science. I don't need to tell you what kind of, how this reflects on what's happening today. It is a story of what happens when we disinvest in infrastructure because of austerity and inequality. But once again, it is a story of an environmental justice that was not the first environmental injustice, but a story of environmental injustices that continue throughout this nation to this day. So I want to kind of rewind and share a little bit of kind of what happened in Flint, how we got to where we, are, we were, and, and really more importantly, share where we are. So Flint was really suffering from decades of crisis and decades of really environmental injustices because of massive manufacturing. And Flint was in a near bankruptcy state in 2011. And right away, overnight, Flint lost democracy. We were under the control of a financial emergency manager who had one job, and his job was, was austerity. It was to save money, no matter what the cost. And that emergency manager reported to the governor there was the no role of elected local officials. And it was decided that the water that we had been getting from the Great Lakes for half a century was too expensive for this poor, predominantly minority community. And that we would stop getting water from the Great Lakes, and instead we would draw water from the local Flint River until a new pipeline to the Great Lakes was to be built. So any Michiganders in the audience? Some show me show me how you tell me where you're from. Show me your okay. Point to where you're from. All right, look around. This is really cool. If you're not from Michigan, California can't do this. Okay, so if from Flint area, are you from Flint? 
Saginaw, north of Flint. Okay, so Michigan is the mitten state, right? So we have a lower peninsula. We also forget we have an upper peninsula. But, but and here's Flint, literally kind of in the middle of, of the mitten. So why are we the mitten state? What, what are we surrounded by? The Great Lakes, okay, so we don't have a water accessibility issue. So we are surrounded by the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes are the largest source of fresh water in the world. 20% of the fresh water in the world is around the Great Lakes. Yet to this day, we have a city that cannot turn on their tap and drink safe water. So it was decided it was too expensive for this poor, predominantly minority city. And in April of 2014, by a very simple flip of a switch, we started drawing our water from the local Flint River. And it didn't seem right. And the heroic people of Flint absolutely raised their voices. And they said, my water is brownish and greenish, and it tastes weird, and my kids are getting rashes. And we had bacteria, and we had boil advisories, and then they dumped a lot of chlorine, and that felt like people were taking a bath in a swimming pool and drinking bleach that irritated skin and eyes. Then we had so much chlorine in this water, it led to a high level of disinfectant byproducts, which are carcinogens. And just a few months after this water switch, General Motors, which was born in Flint, stopped using this water because it was corroding their engine parts at their plant. So think about that. Our water was corroding engine parts. But the entire time, the state of Michigan was telling the people of Flint to relax, that everything was OK. So the Flint water was missing an important ingredient called corrosion control, federally mandated ingredient. And without that ingredient, our water was 19 times more corrosive than the water that we were getting from, from the Great Lakes. And it was so corrosive that it ate up our lead-based plumbing. We have a lot of lead service lines. We have lead in our premise plumbing, which is the plumbing inside our homes. We had lead in water levels in the hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of parts per billion. The EPA action level, which is not health-based, is set at 15 parts per billion. We had a home with a lead level of 22,000 parts per billion of lead in water. And that lead in water data came to us because of citizen science. So uh, an amazing uh, environmental researcher in Virginia Tech, Mark Edwards, when he heard that Flint wasn't treating their water properly, he was contacted by a mom, an amazing Flint mom named Leanne Walters. And he packed his minivan overnight with grad students and supplies. And he drove up to Flint and worked hand in hand with the people of Flint to prove that there was lead in the water. And they did. And they were attacked and dismissed and denied. And then by sheer randomness, I heard um, from a high school girlfriend who happens to be a drinking water expert, like have diverse friends in lots of different disciplines, who was at my house hanging out, drinking a glass of wine. Our kids were playing together. Um, and she, she shared that, um, that the water wasn't being treated properly. And because of this lack of corrosion control, there would be lead in the water. And that was a year and a half after the water switch. And that was the very first time I heard the word lead. And when a pediatrician hears the word lead, when anybody in public health hears the word lead, we freak out. We absolutely freak out because we know what lead does. It's a potent, irreversible neurotoxin. Incredible science has brought us to the point that we now know there is no safe level of lead. Levels we thought were okay decades ago when we had paint, and lead in paint and lead in gasoline, we now know are no longer okay. And I also freaked out because I also knew lead was a form of environmental injustice. Because I already knew my Flint kids already had higher levels of lead. Just like kids in Detroit and Chicago and Philadelphia and Baltimore. Struggling with every toxicity, they now had this added burden. So in rapid speed and in kind of detective fashion, which you can read about in my book, um, we did the research to prove the impact, which never needed to happen. 
We never needed, I, my work never should have happened. This crisis should have ended when that first mom raised her jug of brown water and said there was something wrong. It should have ended when those car parts were corroding. It should have ended when we knew there was lead in the water. But to move this mountain that we were in, I knew I needed that cumulative impact or that impact that it was increasingly in the bodies of our children. So as I said earlier, I, I literally walked out of my clinic and I stood up at a podium, but I was shorter. I could hardly like peek out. And I stood up at a press conference, which is an academic no-no. And I shared the science that after the water switch, our children had an increase in the burden of, of lead in their blood. And I was also attacked, just like everybody else who had raised any concerns in the story. And you know, for a moment, um, you know, the entire state, every arm of the state was saying I was wrong. They called me an unfortunate researcher, that I was splicing, dicing numbers, that I was causing near hysteria, which is also wonderfully sexist. And, and for a minute, I absolutely, I believed them. I was scared. I thought to myself, maybe I should have just stayed busy, pediatrician, mom, wife. Why did, I, why did I step out of my box? Why did I take this risk? I was physically ill. And ultimately, it was the children that got me back in this fight and made me realize that my research, my numbers, my statistics were just, were not numbers. They were kids. There were kids that I, as a pediatrician, have literally taken an oath to protect. And we fought back. We fought back with more science, more evidence, more numbers. And finally, the state conceded and exposed this man-made crisis, raised by the voices of the incredible people of Flint who had been vocal throughout this crisis. And from that point on, we have been on a road to recovery in Flint, we still cannot drink our water. We are still on bottled water and filtered water because our damaged lead pipes are being replaced. We've already replaced about 7,000 lead pipes. We've got about 10,000 more to go. We will only be the third city in the country that has replaced their lead pipes. There's a lot more work that we need to do as a nation. But I get to spend my every day working on the tomorrows of our children. We cannot take away what happened. There is no magic pill. There is no antidote. But there's a lot that we can do to promote the development of our children. So sometimes I say that I'm actually writing prescriptions for hope. Um, but it's so much more than just words. So we've put into place things like two brand new child care centers, home visiting programs, trauma-informed care, behavioral health services, school health, school health clinics, uh, early literacy programs, um, home visiting programs, breastfeeding support. And the list goes on and on and on of things that we've been able to put in place to promote the development of our children. And we're also working on the bigger things that kids and families need, like restorative justice, that accountability, that's important. Self-determination, having a voice at the table, being partners in this work. Economic development. These are all things that kids need all over. And we hope to very much share our best practices of what we're doing in Flint with communities all over facing similar toxicities, be it the toxicity of, of lead, or be it the toxicities of poverty, lost democracy, austerity, racism, discrimination, all of these impact the life course trajectories of our children. I saw these wonderful signs at this conference about zip codes. Flint is one of those places. It's a place where a kid in Flint lives actually 15 years less than a kid in a neighboring zip code. And that's not unique to Flint, that's everywhere. And we need to do better for all of these kids because your zip code of birth, the water that comes out of your tap should not predict where you end up. So there have been incredible ripple effects of our Flint work, and that's the story of kind of hope that we want to share. People are paying attention to drinking water. They're testing. Schools have done amazing work because there's lead in all of our water, because the lead industry was evil and powerful for too long. 
People are talking about lead again. We thought lead was a problem of yesterday. It's a problem of today. It's a problem of tomorrow. We're talking about environmental injustice, as we should. Yes, it's been around for about 30 years, but we have a lot more work to do together. So I'm grateful to be here. I look forward um, to your discussion and questions. And once again, um, this, is, this is my community I started with, and it's great to be back in this community. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, now it's time for the free for all. You know, this is uh, uh, what's on your mind, your thoughts, your ideas, your questions, your comments. Um, I, you know, I think we're gonna maybe go a little less than half an hour and end this at about 8:15. Uh, but we'll see how it goes. The food is still here. Do feel free to avail yourself of any of that that you'd like. But if you'd like to make a comment or, or ask a question, please go to one of the mics. And I'm gonna move over here where I can see. If we have people. Yes, would you begin, please? Yes, my name's Rick Rabin. I'm, uh, I'm in the Boston, Massachusetts area. Uh, long history of working around lead and also worker uh, health and safety issues. And, and I know that this, the problem of lead both in the water the, the pipes and the paint. The scientists knew decades and decades ago that this was a big problem, but they didn't have movements, they didn't have workers, they didn't have communities who were active and banging on their legislators' doors to do something about the problem. And so I, I think it's a good example of we need both. We need the activist, public health people, such as we just heard, and we need uh, people on, on the streets banging on the doors. Thank you. Thank you. Over here next, please. Thank you so much for your presentation on all the work that you and um, all of Flint has been doing <clears throat> for restorative justice. I was very curious about the content of this because obviously no human life is worth any amount of money. And so we have a tension in you know, the very sort of terms of restorative justice, at least as far as um, our legal system is involved. At the same time, you know, there was a, a few recent reports showing that the major industries of the world, if they internalized all of their health and environmental externalities, they would not be profitable. So what do you see as the role for um, you know, public health researchers, uh, uh, MDs like yourself, in um, working towards this larger um, sort of question, this preventative measure of restorative justice um, in order to make it so that the next flint won't happen? I think that's a great question, and we're all here at the public health conference, and wouldn't it be great if we spent more money on prevention, more on our proactive efforts than being reactive? Uh, Flint's is a great example, so this was all to save money, uh, but we've ended up spelling, spending millions and millions and close to a billion more than we ever would have saved. Um, if only we'd put more money into into lead prevention and drinking water prevention. And, I mean, it, we, we say this all the time, this is what public health and pediatrics is really all about. Um, so, in terms of Flint, um, there is efforts at accountability, which will hopefully get at some of that restorative justice, and there is a role for reparations. Uh, there are some massive class action lawsuits that are underway. There's about 18 criminal charges that have been filed, and some of them include homicide charges. I talked about lead. We also had one of the out largest outbreaks of Legionnaires' disease where people died. So many officials, including in our environmental departments, our state health departments, have been charged also with homicide because those are all ongoing, and those are important. Um, but the class action lawsuits which get at, at damages. How do you put a price on that? How do you put a price? Um, so they're, they're looking at risk levels, um, a younger child versus an older person. Um, but it is very difficult work. But yes, wouldn't it be nice if we did that beforehand? Um, Let is a great example where we know the return on investment of the work. Uh, a great report came out from uh, Pew uh, RWJ a few years ago, the Health Impact Project, 
which showed that if we actually did lead elimination work before children were exposed, as a nation, we would save $80 billion a year. Decreased economic productivity, criminal justice costs, special education costs, healthcare costs. We even know the economics of doing this work, um, yet it, it doesn't transfer to political will. I think we're next over here. Am I right? Please go ahead. Hi, um, I'm actually LA based, so I do work with um, a lot of you folks. It's, I'm, I'm very happy to see um, Diane being able to speak to such a, a wonderful group of folks. Um, I work, work with um, physicians for social responsibility, so <laughs> which um, Dr. Hannah, I want to thank you so much for you know for for being one of those physicians that uplifts that work. I know I heard someone asked a question earlier about um, having health professionals engage in this type of work, um, and I think. A more specific question um, for um, for Arsenio, but also for um, for all four of you, is um, you know in our work we we get a lot of pushback. Um, we our organization uses Calen BioScreen um, quite a bit. One of the products I work on, we use it, and it, it seems like such a straightforward tool. Like this, these are you know the facts. This is these this is the burden throughout California. Yet we saw a lot of pushback. Um, you know when we tried to um, implement legislation, especially from our folk up north. Um, and I'm wondering, what, what do you guys see as the most effective means of, um, of pushing against that pushback? Um, like I said, when you're trying to implement a, such a very simple tool like Calen Screen, you have so much pushback. You know, what, what kind of policies would you recommend proposing or what kind of strategies would you guys recommend using, um, you know, especially for folks trying to implement something similar in other um, parts of the country? You know, is it better to work with or against legislature, um, legislators, um, working with other organizations? Like, you know what? What is what is your um, your guys's approach? To well, that? Let, yeah. Let, let's be clear. the 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 fight isn't about the tool. The right. top. The fight's about the money. <laughs> they don't give a. I mean, the, nobody. Nobody. When before the the tool was attached to money, you know, people weren't really paying that close of attention to it. The industry was, businesses were, you know, folks involved in that. But people were just not engaged on it. But once money was associated to it, then the tool became a problem. So, I mean, the fight really isn't about whether or not the right indicators are in the tool or whether or not, um, you, know, um, um, you know, certain communities come up or not. It's about, it's about money. I would say that those communities that do good, and I'll just call it out, like the, the, like the Bay Area, for example, complains a lot about Cal and Bioscreen. They say that the, the tool doesn't represent their overall burdens or whatever. Um, the, the Bay Area does plenty fine on all the funding that comes through our various environmental programs. They actually only represent, I think, around 5% of what we call the disadvantaged communities, the areas that are in red, but they get still around 20% of the funding throughout the state. So they are a machine, they have capacity, like where I come from and Luis come from, Luis is like one of the few nonprofits in the Imperial County. You know, where I come from, we don't have any nonprofits gearing up for to applying for grants and all this stuff. There's a, a, a capacity built in these regions that have the ability to get it. So be clear, it's about money. It's not about the tool. And I would say I would say to those folks that, you know, here now you have the opportunity. We have in place a tool that is at least maybe we should be shooting for more, but as at least bringing some resources to our community that have been long overdue. And um, now isn't the time to sort of um, dismiss that. So I think we need to continue to fight for what we've, all of us have fought for. Um, but, you know, um, and, and the sick part of this, the sick part is that once the money got involved, once the money was associated with the tool, then people wanted their communities to be red. And if you live in one of these communities that are red, you know, you damn well know that you don't want to be, you don't want to be that way. I want to be the green community, the community that has very little environmental impact, the community that has low asthma rates, the community that has low heart attack rates. You know, that's sick. To, to, you know, so, so money does a lot of things, but, you know, but that, that's what has happened with, with this particular tool. And so now the people that like to get hands on money have chosen to attack the tool. They haven't attacked the scientific integrity. There have been comments of which have been warranted for adjustments and for modifications. That's one story. But a wholesale dismissal of the tool is really about money and not about the science. Thank you. Next two over here, please. So, uh, 
Thank you so, so much, uh, first and foremost. This is an inspiring uh, panel to, to, to witness and to be here for. Uh, thank you all for the work that you do um, and for the, the, the role models that you are. Um, personally, my, uh, my name is Julian. I'm coming from Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, my background is in community-based grassroots environmental justice work, uh, and uh, which led me to become the uh, manager of the state's asthma program at the Department of Health. Um, and now I'm getting my MPH, so looking at the intersection of public health and activism and academia and how they all work together, and thank you for all for connecting the dots between those ones. Uh, the thing that I wanted to offer, the part comment to part question um, around intersectionality between environmental justice issues and, and other social justice issues, and I, I really see all social justice issues as being EJ issues, um, but in particular around the issue of police violence and how that intersects with environmental justice issues. Um, the comment part of it is uh, related to an APHA uh, policy statement that's been in the works in a battle over the past three years trying to pass a policy statement that says that police violence is a public health issue um, and come up with some really good solid uh, strategies for how to address that using a public health lens. Uh, and there's an event tomorrow, a, a half-day shadow conference related to that um, at Centro Cultural de la Raza. Uh, so if anyone's interested, just raise your hand and I'll walk around and give you a flyer for it. Uh, so that was the comment part um, in the announcement, and I was just wondering if uh, any panelists who wanted to could share how you see your work intersecting with issues like police violence or other social justice issues. Real quickly, and I mentioned it, so you, you can't live in a bubble. You can't just be single-issued. Everything is connected. And the Flint story is a perfect example. It's a story, like I said, it's a democracy story. So then you have to talk about why aren't you know people's voices being heard. And then we need to talk about voter suppression. And mass incarceration plays a role um, in that issue. It's also a poverty issue. And then it's, it's also a disinvestment issue. It's a, I mean, there's uh, medicine and, and public health and race. There's so so many intersectionalities of, of Flint, and then as an example, that's that's how it is in many places. So you have to be able to 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 really address all of these different lanes and work in all these different lanes. People ask me, like, you're a pediatrician, like, why are you talking, you know, about police violence or mass incarceration? I'm like, because it takes away the parents of my children, and it takes, you know, and it impacts their entire life course trajectory. So it's it's part of my work too. Um, so I think we have to kind of more holistically put all of this in the bubble of public health and environmental justice. They're all connected. Can I just? Sorry, I got I too engaged here and I dropped my mic. Were you going to add okay, something? I just want to say thank you for, I don't know where he went, but um, thank you for your work. And I'm glad that you're going to be meeting at the, at the Centro. That's a historical, important place in San Diego um, to be meeting. But I also want to say in terms of intersectionality to second what um, Dr. Mona has said, but also to say that you know, the story I, I led with in terms of the um, firebomb of one of our ally organizations, a social justice organization that just completed, uh, unfortunately, a failed campaign uh, for rent control in National City. That's another example of the intersectionality of environmental justice and social justice. And that organization was joined by Environmental Health Coalition and other social justice allies um, because we know of the importance of affordable housing as well as safe and healthy housing. And our Healthy Kids Director is here, uh, Leticia Ayala, who's been fighting for that for over 20 years um, and trying to ensure that children are protected from lead but also have a safe and healthy place to grow up. So all of those things go together. I don't know how we um, separate those, and then also to address the rate of criminalization in our communities that's, that's fueled by exposure to, to lead and so many other things that you've talked about. So I'm glad that we're looking at that intersectionality, and I think it also relates to Cal Enviro Screen. All of those indicators are um, ones that come together to say these are the places where we need to be focusing, these are the places where we need to be investing. And I I would agree with you to a certain degree, um, Arsenio, that it's about the money and that we're fighting about it because now we want it. Um, but I think it's also about denying um, what we've done to these communities over all these years. I still hear, yeah, I'm, we're not really sure that's exactly right, unless, of course, we can put our hand out for some money. And, and I just want to say one other thing since we're on the town hall part, and that is that 
um, maybe I've been doing this too long, but I do think that we used to have regulations that would come into place where industries would have to start to conform to regulations without having incentives and money that would um, enable them to do that. And I think we all appreciate having assistance for companies to have incentives to be able to change out their diesel engines or um, do whatever needs to be done. But now um, it's really about if, you, if there's no money on the table, we're not doing it. And Cal Viroscreen has helped for there to be that money on the table. But I think we need to adjust uh, the expectation that we can't pass a regulation without having money behind it. And that's become the way that we're doing regulation these days. And I think it's problematic. Uh, so I hope that we can um, begin to shift that trajectory a little bit as well, because we have these communities that we need to repair, like the one that, that you're talking about. Thank you. Um, this mic, please. Hi. Uh, I first want to also express my admiration for Dr. Atisha and also the nurse who spoke before for combining their professional work and exposing themselves to the powers that be for uh, you know really being courageous and and s stepping forward for justice. Um, I'm uh, Anthony Churg, the physical chemist that's working with Maria Estrada, and I had a nuts and bolts question. It seems to me that we have to get blood lead levels in that community. How did you come to get the levels? of lead, were they, were they the people who just came to your clinic, or how did that happen, and how would you recommend we go about getting the measurements? We also have a hexavalent chromium problem with a uh, uh, turbine engine manufacturer, uh, Carlton Forge, and other companies in, in, in a neighboring town. So for too long, we have been using children as detectors of environmental contamination. And lead is a perfect example. So we test children's lead, blood for lead. Um, it only tells us there's an environmental problem. And there's nothing that we can do for children. But that's how we continue to do it. We need to be focusing on the primary prevention, which is looking at the lead in the environment first, um, and then taking action. Um, which should have happened in Flint and didn't, so then I had to do the blood lead research. My research was done on retrospective blood lead levels. We routinely screen children um, who are high risk for lead at their well child visits at the ages of one and two. So all I did, and it was the one of the easiest research projects I've ever done, was just look back at in time um, and look at children's lead levels that were part of their routine screening and compare them before the water lead level to, to at water switch to, to after the water switch. And it was an underestimation of exposure because lead screening is recommended at the developmental ages when they're most at risk for household lead exposure. At the ages of one and two, kids are crawling and walking and they have hand to mouth activity. They're at risk for lead paint and lead soil and lead dust, not lead in water. Um, so it was also an underestimation of exposure because that's not when children are most at risk for lead in water. So it was retrospective research on data we had in our clinical records. I tried to get the data from our state. Uh, they have a childhood lead poisoning prevention program. They were not forthcoming. So I had access to our clinical medical records in our community um, and went through the IRB process and, and did that research on that. It's all in the book, too. <laughs> I, I commend the book to all of you. It's very, very readable and understandable. And book signing tomorrow. Lot, so. It was on Oprah's okay. summer reading list. I mean, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to this question first. This gentleman's been very patient. We have one over here, and I can't see you. That's why I'm not sure who it is. Um, and then I, uh, Manuel Pastor is going to make a comment. I asked him. He's, his name has come up a lot, and I thought we should give him a moment here to say, say what's on his mind. We'll come back to you for any very last words that you would want to have, and then we'll, uh, Charles will take us out. Unless anyone else has a burning issue, in which case you should jump up right now. Please go ahead. Yes, I'm uh, Dr. Mark Mitchell with uh, from Hartford. And I started the Connecticut Coalition for Environmental Justice and uh, am now an advisor uh, to it. Um, I'm now working with uh, George Mason University around um, climate change and climate justice. And um, so I wanted to bring up that issue. Um, as we know, uh, climate, the people who are most affected by climate change uh, tend to be low-income um, people, 
um, and also people of color um, in this country and then uh, developing nations um, and island nations are affected internationally. Um, and the, we know that, that climate change makes almost anything that we do to address environmental um, injustice much more difficult uh, because it, it sort of sets us back um, on things like asthma, allergies, et cetera. But we also know that the opportunities uh, that we have by addressing uh, climate change can also bring uh, unparalleled uh, climate uh, uh, environmental uh, environmental justice uh, to our communities if the um, processes are uh, uh, addressed in, in the uh, in a good manner. Um, you know, because we know that. Uh, communities of color are more likely to live near coal-fired power plants, some uh, ha have petroleum uh, uh, being uh, pumped in their backyards in, in Los Angeles area, uh, and, and other types of things. So I wanted to hear your comments on um, how uh, addressing climate change, um, how to address uh, climate change so that it is a benefit uh, uh, to environmental justice communities. I'll just start by saying, like, for me, the decarbonization of the economy, like, immediately um, would lead to some of the biggest environmental justice wins ever. Um, if you go through L.A. and you look at these massive corridors where all your goods, you know, most of your, half of your goods that you purchase, wherever you purchase them, come from, you know, through the ports of L.A. and then get distributed out to the rest of the nation. And through those corridors live people, mainly people of color, um, that that um, you know catch the brunt of that pollution burden. A decarbonized future that looks at electrification of the transportation goods movement um, sort of sector, as well as just the general transportation sector. When I look at those maps on Kellen Virus screen, that has the probably biggest potential to shift those communities that are in dark red to maybe in some orange. You know, other than that, we're really, we don't really have too many tools in our chest to be able to have that dramatic shift of the, of the cumulative load. But it's, it's huge, and there's people that are looking at, and Manuel's gonna speak next, and he'll probably, or he'll talk about this, about that are looking at, you know, they've been looking, he's been looking at climate, like what we're doing on Kellen Bioscreen as it relates to um, climate vulnerability for almost a decade now, I think. I don't know how long he's been looking at it, but um, we're keeping an eye on on, on, on that. But I, I think it has the, the, the potential to sort of reap. Now, of course, there's issues with just transition and how you do that, and we need to be careful and, and make sure that we um, put in place the right policies to make sure people aren't left behind. But um, it does serve as a potential, um, while it's our probably biggest threat, it's also our biggest opportunity. Yeah. Just one thing that I think is really important, you can't just keep contracting somebody to solve the uh, climate change crisis for communities. You have to involve communities. It's so important. Uh, we have to build the capacities so that the expertise is left in the community. So to me, that's one of the most important things that uh, we're missing the, the, the target is, is we think that we're just gonna find some consultant, find one uh, academic or find one public health person, or it's, it's not gonna happen in a sustainable way. We need to build the capacities, we need to build the education, we need to start in the schools, and we need to work with local junior colleges, with universities at the local level. Uh, it cannot continue to be sustainable if, it, if we don't leave, an institution, leave the institution uh, to continue to support the environmental justice and, and leave those capacities behind. Thank you. Question over here. I think we're not hearing you. Could you get a little closer to the mic? Uh, is that better? Yeah. Okay. 
I, I say it's not every time I get to point to my hand as a Michigander and point out where the thumb is and actually use that as a map. But I appreciate that. <laughs> no, I'm just, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Saginaw is in the same boat as what Flint was or is. And having grown up there with uh, a lot of family members at GM and Flint and Saginaw, I'm fully aware of those conditions. But I wanted to speak briefly as a nurse to conditions in Nicaragua and Guatemala as an expansion of this whole issue. Um, you know, so I'm walking up a mountain with a Cuban doctor and a couple of uh, Guatemalan nurses, and I'm carrying a bag of vaccinations to the top of like 9,000 feet. And um, well, I felt pretty good because there was a 20-year-old 20, 20 Guatemalan that said, you know, you're in as good a shape as my dad is. Of course, my dad carries a 100-pound sack of potatoes when he comes to the top of the hill, you know, which all of a sudden, you know, there goes that. But as we were talking about vaccinations, childhood vaccinations, you know, we're feeling good about what we're doing and so forth, the, the Cuban doctor then went on to explain that actually the big problem they have there is TB. And having worked with TB in Michigan around Lansing with, during the, the grape boycott and other farm worker issues in Michigan for a fairly brief time, but um, you know, back a long time when, the, when Cesar Chavez was involved, um, it became clear to me that the issue was really not TB. The issue was that if we treated a person with six months doses of TB medication, the family was all living in one room and everyone else was gonna get TB anyway. And the attitude was among the Guatemalan government, which was just shortly after the end of the war there, um, which has never really ended. But the issue was that it's useless. It's useless to try to treat people for TB if they're all gonna live in the same room. And it was useless to treat people, farm workers, Mexican farm workers in Michigan for TB because the farms themselves that brought these workers in were not going to expand the housing conditions and make it better for the workers. So the real issue was, again, as someone else said, it was money and it was profit and it was like, really, nobody gave a hoot about Guatemalan peasants on the top of the mountain and really, nobody gave a hoot about the Mexican farm workers in Lansing, Michigan, outside of Lansing, Michigan. And I. I, I think that's the whole hidden, dirty aspect of capitalism and uh, the idea of class, and yes, there's racism involved, and there's all of these things that somehow we do get into our silos and we talk about, you know, like, okay, we could treat TB, you know, but really, what's the point, you know, if we're not going to explore these larger issues? And I, 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 I hear you people up there on the stage is getting the issue. And I think that's good. I think that's really what we need to do. So, you know, as a nurse, I, I see this combination of all these things together, and we can't save the world in one little aspect, but we need to think broader and get out of the silo and ex expand that discussion. So, thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you for your comment. <laughs> and the thanks of the audience. Manuel. So Amy asked me to say something because my name got mentioned several times. I'm Manuel Pastor. I'm a researcher at the University of Southern California. I've been working on EJ issues since the mid-1990s with Rachel Morello uh James Sad, and now with a bunch of other younger scholars as well. Uh, three things very quickly. Uh, first, Dr. Mona, I am now a total fanboy. Uh, I, I knew I liked you. I didn't know how much I would like you. Uh, uh, the second is I wanna kind of uncover a little bit of uh, the story that Arsenio told in a way that might be useful to people in other states. Because it is true that our team uh, developed something called the environmental justice screening method, uh, working with a lot of community-based groups in a very open and transparent way. And that when Cal Enviro Screen began to be developed within the agencies, uh, what was very interesting, and this I think speaks to what we as public health professionals can contribute to is what is an inside-outside strategy? Because basically, we started working inside with the agencies. First, we were telling them, you know, what you're developing is really terrible. Um, and then they brought it out into the community, and the community said, you know, what you just developed was really terrible. Uh, and the community kept pressuring from the outside, but we kept having what we called 
nerd to nerd relationships uh, with the technical people on the inside who were helping the political people come along by saying this is the best science. So I think there's many ways to play this, but I think thinking through this combination of inside and outside, how you work, how you make sure that the community-based organizations that you work with are continuing to pressure and not settle and not trust the agency, but how we as public health professionals often need to work with the agencies and the professionals there to kind of move things along and figure out how that works together. The last thing um, I'll say is one of the reasons why I think this kind of a panel is so important. Um, and it has to do with the following thing, which is not just the science, not just the fact that when you do the research, the gradient of disparity around race is steeper than the gradient of disparity around income. This is not about the market. This is about political power and voiceless communities not being able to achieve what they need to achieve in terms of protecting their health. But even if that wasn't true, uh, someone asked a question about climate change. There's now a recent national poll that squares with 10 years of polling in California. I'll just tell you the most recent poll. When you ask in California, who cares the most about climate change and says that they are willing to sacrifice because they think it's an important issue for protecting the planet and the quality of life and the economy of California, most people would imagine that the people who are the most concerned about climate change are sort of like a young white guy in bicycle shorts, right? Sort of throwing granolas over his shoulder going, I care about the climate, right? Uh, it turns out that Public Policy Institute of California, just likely voters, 51% of white Californians think that climate change is a serious issue. 69% of Latino voters think it's a serious issue, a little bit less for black and Asian voters. If you wanna do something about climate, you better do something about environmental justice because these are the constituencies that are coming face to face with the risks of climate change, with the edge of environmental disasters. And if we just even want to move an environmental agenda, we need to move an environmental justice agenda and realize that centering equity is actually about protecting the planet. Okay. Well, I, I think we're um, finished with our questions from the floor. Um, as I say, I'll give you all a last moment to say your last succinct comment, and then we'll wrap up this panel and turn it over to Charles. Yeah, so uh, just a couple of brief comments. One is uh, don't underestimate your role. Those of you who are in public health, don't underestimate your role and your influence on environmental justice communities. Um, I actually, uh, my organization, got introduced to the environmental justice movement uh, by the uh, State Department, the California State Department of Public Health, the Environmental Health Investigations Branch. They're the ones who introduced me to people in the environmental justice movement. Uh, the other is, uh, Dr. Manuel Pastor said, said it very well, it's, it's how important to be able to have two-track uh, abilities to, yes, um, make sure that you continue to apply the pressure and, and continue to uh, ask the questions and continue to demand from government. But it's, it is so important to also have the ability to create another track so that you can work with, uh, with diverse stakeholders, public health, whether it's uh, government. We have to be able to take what's there on the table and don't ever rely, uh, and this is for everybody and for anybody, don't ever expect government to solve your problem. Just because you showed up people and you showed up to a government meeting and walked away and people gave you handshakes and says, you know what, I understand what you're going through and I hear you, don't take that for granted. Get involved. Be there. It doesn't matter what, what sector you represent, you know, whether it's direct medical service, whether it's public health or everything and anybody. Don't rely on anybody. If you've given a role and an opportunity to step up to, to be empowered, you know, I heard this once at one point, uh, don't just be empowered and be in a position of power and demand a position of power so that you can influence the, the, the outcome and, and the solutions for your communities and for uh, other areas of interest. As the government rep here, um, I, I would say what Manuel, you know, really touched upon is a whole other panel, and that's the inside out strategy, working inside out. And I think over the last six or seven years, um, 
we have really, really worked on that. And um, um, I, I just, um, there are times where you have to understand that there are people like us that work in the government that fight it on the inside and we fight it on the outside. So we catch hell when everybody's hitting, you know, community's pushing us. And then on the inside, we're fighting the institution. All the things, these, these structures that are in place to not effectuate change or not do anything different, we are fighting those inside. So we're fighting on the inside, we're fighting on the outside, and um, support those people who do that because it could get very, you know, um, you know it, it's, a, it's a very uh, lonely world. Um, the, the other thing I would say is that for those from other states, California's environmental policy has been, has been turned on its head. And it's being led with an equity lens and justice lens. And um, this will happen eventually in other states. And so when you talk about the major climate policies, the major wins that California has done, any important climate change, any important environmental policy that California has put together, look closely. And I guarantee you, you will not see a, a major policy without some sort of equity component to it. It's just not going to happen anymore. Those days are gone. And so right now, the policy has been turned on its head. The power is still sort of being you know, disrupted. But um, pay attention to that, because I think you know, as you will see this play out, it's coming to your state soon, and it should. Oh. That's all. I thought you were going to give us more of a, a futuristic projection. Oh, no. no. Okay. Um, yeah, <laughs> it was good. Uh, so we're getting late, right? And for you, it's even later, Eastern right? Time. Eastern time, sorry. Um, it's about building power. So I think we all in this room know that uh, we build power at different levels. Those of you within academic institutions, those of you inside government, you're building power um, and credibility and the ability to make change. And we're doing that in the community as well. So it's about building leadership. It's about a leadership pipeline that allows a mom um, to become a pediatrician <laughs> and to make change. It allows folks in our communities uh, to learn about what the impacts are and who the decision makers are and how they can speak truth to power and how they can work with um, academics and scientists like all of you and those that have made change. So if we don't uh, see each other as our allies, then we do that at our peril, I think. So we have that ability and the privilege, really, to work together to make the change. I, I think that equity is here in California uh, on paper, and it's beginning to be there with dollars. We have uh, some of the leading environmental policies. I would say that on climate, uh, I would agree with Manuel, and, uh, and I would also say that we have the wrong framework. It's a market-based framework. It needs to be a public health-based framework, and that's one of the sh shifts that really needs to occur. I think we can still have the money flow that should be there to invest in our communities, uh, but we don't need to uh, make a payoff uh, to corporate polluters in order for that to occur. So that's a change I hope that we can all work for together uh, to benefit our communities. So the title of my book is What the Eyes Don't See. And it's about the very literal, we don't see lead in water, it's clear, it's odorless, it's tasteless. It's also, we don't see the impacts of lead. It's known as a silent pediatric epidemic. So it's very much about the story. But it's it's so much more than that. It's about people and places and problems that we choose not to see. And that's really what environmental justice is all about. It's those people, it's over there, it's not us, that'll never happen to me, that they're different than me. But it is about our responsibility, no matter who we are, what we do, or, or, or where we live, to, to open our eyes. Um, they are our neighbors, they are your children as much as they are my children. And that not only do we have to be awake and alert, um, we have to act and we have to fight even when it's hard, even when it's scary, even when we take risks because it is what, what is right. So I will echo what Luis said is that we all have power. We are all powerful people. 
Um, we and we have more power when we come together. Um, so please recognize that you, all of you, have incredible power, and all you have to do is open your eyes, and you will find injustices around you that need you and your voice. Thank you. So I'm now going to turn it over to Charles, who's going to take us out. Thank you, um, and thank you all for um, being here for this um, host session. I want to start by uh, just uh, recognizing um, the comments that were made about Standing Rock and about Exide in LA and Diane's comments about you know, the uh, firebombing of the, um, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the office um, for the ally organization and, um, and just uh, reflect on the fact that, um, you know, the work, um, um, there's a lot of work to be done. And uh, when we, um, when we are, we're trying to plan and, and figure out how to, how to uh, talk about the things that have taken place, um, both in, um, um, in, um, in California and in Flint, uh, we realized that, you know, we gotta really do it in an authentic way. And, um, and we gotta recognize that um, you know, there, there is progress, there's a lot of work, but there's a lot of work to be done. But having said that, um, you know, I want to um, kind of um, uh, share with you um, what moved us to um, have this uh, EJ Town Hall was that um, we realized that uh, there were many powerful uh, examples of progress and resistance uh, at the local and state levels that inspire us at this time in our national life. Um, and that these are really important because um, it isn't just about what was accomplished, but what it took to accomplish that. And, uh, and the lessons that, are, are, that can be drawn from that, that can be shared. And so that is the real heart of, the, um, of our vision behind this EJ Town Hall. And I think thanks, um, to our fabulous speakers, uh, Diane and uh, Arsenia Luis and Dr. Mona, and to our um, eminent facilitator, uh, Dr. Amy, Amy Kyle, I think they did a really, really great job. So I think they deserve a, a round of applause. And I also want to um, kind of uh, express uh, my own appreciation for all the people that Natalie Sampson um, uh, uh, recognized earlier. Um, uh, but to uh, close by talking about um, the uh, environment section of the uh, American Public Health Association, not only to give our thanks and to recognize the chair, our, our chair, uh, Joyce Nut Jahai, uh, right over here, uh, for their... Um, unswerving and enthusiastic support. But, um, but what I wanted to point out um, was the explicit connections that were involved. This, and that's expressed by the committees that uh, endorsed this event. The Climate and Health Topic Committee, the Built Environment Committee, the Children's Environmental Health Committee, the, the Food and Environment Committee, um, the Community-Based Public Health um, caucus in APHA, and then the California um, chapter of the American Public Health Association is planning uh, for uh, uh, the American Planning Association, I'm sorry, the American Planning Association's uh, planning for a uh, health initiative, which is a very important um, collaboration of APHA and APA. Uh, and I point these out, and these are only scratching the surface because they formed the roadmap for our, for our call to action. Um, our vision and hope is that you would take, you, uh, the members of APHA, would take um, uh, different aspects, specific uh, uh, models and lessons um, from uh, the progress and resistance and integrate it into your work as you think about future plans. Um, and we will hope that in that process, that you uh, work with us, uh, with the Environmental Justice Committee on our overarching projects, like the, a, um, uh, developing a environmental justice policy statement for the entire APHA, uh, like 
Um, the recommendations of, the, of last year's uh, Climate Justice uh, Summit, which took place at uh, Smallman College uh, in Atlanta. And we want to ask each and every one of you to elevate your own personal, individual commitment to environmental justice by working to provide direct support to impacted communities. And there is a way for you to, uh, to, to do that, and that is the technical assistance project that Megan Lashaw over here uh, from Johns Hopkins University started. And I just want to say, I told Megan that um, it really is a credit to her that she would start a project like that because that is the thing that is really, really hard to do. And, and it is something that we want each and every, we want to ask in terms of this call for action, uh, each and, to think about, you know, contributing to. So, in conclusion, we all know that environmental justice and public health are integrally connected. We also know um, that there are many examples of the potential for significant progress around environmental justice and public health over the next several years coalescing in many parts of the country, just like it did in California. And so the one example I will leave you with uh, as, a, as a evidence of that is the fact that our, um, our uh, beloved Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha was just named the co-chair of the transition team for um, Gretchen Whitmer, who is the newly, newly elected governor for the state of Michigan. And this, this shows the importance of the things that we talked about today and the possibility of them being applied in other parts of the country. So we will hope you, that you take the things that we have shared with you uh, and, and take our collective work uh, on these important issues to an entirely new level. So thank you so much for coming.